Hi, I'm William Bassferry, Chef Instructor at the Community College of Philadelphia. In the kitchen circles, I am known as Chef Bill. I like this part of the year for three different reasons. Number one, the change of seasons in the fall. My birthday is in the fall. And also, there's an abundance of produce, uh, not only with squash, but also with apples that we can enjoy not only this time, but also as well into the winter months. Today, we're going to do three recipes with an apple. This is a gala apple. Originally, it's from New Zealand. It's not indigenous to the United States. Uh, it was introduced to this country in 1970. It's a mildly sweet, very fleshy, firm apple. Great tasting. You can eat it raw or you can use it to cook with. Today, we're going to make three recipes. We're going to make apple tapioca. We are going to make apple blondies. And we're going to make an apple ginger cranberry pie, all using the gala apple. First thing I want to do is I want to turn around and I want to show you how to peel an apple using this particular peeler, which happens to be a corer as well. You can use a potato peeler if you like, but I prefer this. I'm going to save my skins and I'll show you a little trick you can do rather than throw them out. For our recipe today for the apple tapioca, we're going to use five apples. It seems like that seems to be, uh, that's, an, that's enough for a family of four. You could easily turn around and serve it as a dessert. As you can see, I rotate, I rotate the peeler around the apple, taking the skin right off, right into the bowl. Turn it upside down, continue peeling. There's one, four more to go. There's, all, there's over 2,500 varieties of apples that we can enjoy in the United States, and there's over 7,500 worldwide. So it's one of those things where you want to find, because there's so many varieties of apples, you want to find the one that's good for your needs. Now, today it was gala apples. Most folks don't get past Red Delicious or Macintosh. There's Jonah Gold, there's Fuji, Bryburn, uh, Golden Delicious. So there are many, many choices you can have. It depends upon what your application is. You can go from something as soft as a Golden Delicious apple to something as firm as a Granny Smith. A Golden Delicious would be very sweet. A um, Granny Smith is usually on the tart side with a firmer flesh, depending upon what your application is. I've had good experience with Gala apples always firm as you can see the flesh itself nice it's not like a white color but like almost like a yellowish color very tasty and most of the recipes that I've done with this never had any problems flavor wise I always get a good consistent product the uh, the recipes themselves the one for apple tapioca my grandmother uh, put that together and she used to use uh, the Macintosh and the Red Delicious at all. But once, after I got out of culinary school, what I decided was I was gonna look, investigate, and see what else was available. And I've experimented with many, many apples. And I found out that the Gala apple itself is one that works well for this recipe. Now, we have five apples. I'm gonna put the skins over here for now, down the peeler. This is a handy device that you can use, you can buy, and basically it's going to core and it's going to section my apples. So what I want to do is firmly put the ring right on the core and it's just a quick push down. My apple segments come out and I'm left with the core that I, that's the part I can just dispose of. Okay. Now I'm going to put the apples in my saucepan. The apples in my saucepan. Uh, and when I get all five in, I'm going to put it on the stove. We're going to add some water for now. And we're going to actually break down these apples by stewing them. Uh, when we get through with this recipe, it's going to take a darker texture because the apples are going to break down. It's going to look like applesauce with some raisins in it, 
but actually with the extra liquid we put in, along with the tapioca, it's going to be more like a dessert, not just applesauce. It's going to be a thicker product. So here, we're going to put it on the stove. Um, one thing I've noticed about the water in Philadelphia, it's very hard. You can't use it, it's going to affect the taste of your food. So normally what I do, any chance I get, I use bottled or spring water. It makes a much better tasting in your final product. I'm going to put in about a cup and a half of water, turn on the stove, medium heat, and what I want to let that do is I want my apples, they're actually going to slow cook and they're going to break down and with my spoon I'll be able to chunk them up and eventually that's going to be a nice thick nut sauce but an apple product for me. This is going to take about 45 minutes on a low flame. As it gets closer to the end, I'll put in my spices of uh, one teaspoon of cinnamon. I'll put in uh, two, two teaspoons of brown sugar. And I also have a nice assortment of raisins that will also go good, go good uh, flavored with the apple. So that's how we're going to finish off that applesauce. Before I continue with the next recipe, I want to show you what you can do with the, with the apple peels themselves. We're going to put in some cinnamon, give it a sprinkle of cinnamon, maybe a teaspoonful. We're going to give it a tablespoon of light brown sugar. Now, you want to toss the peels so they become encoded with the cinnamon and the brown sugar. You don't have to worry about smaller pieces at this time. All we want to do is coat it. Now the actual moisture inside the skin itself is going to wet down the product and it's actually going to emulsify the cinnamon and the brown sugar. One fact about an apple that's um, from a nutritional standpoint, there is a lot of flavor in the skin itself. As an apple matures, the skin picks up the flavor of the apple as well as the aroma. So if you were to take one of these apples and smell it, you'd smell a nice apple fragrance. Okay, that's pretty much done. And I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, you can see the, that way it's mixed with the peels, the brown sugar, and the cinnamon. It also has a very uh, fragrant aroma to it. Now what you do with this, is put it on a sheet pan lined with parchment. You put it in a 225 degree oven for two hours and you want to let the apples dry out, they slowly will, and they'll harden up. The end result is this product here where you can see it's a different color, okay? The apples are red, they're going to get browner, and they're also going to get crunchier. Now you can use this um, as a snack, or you can just crush it up and you can put it on any other dessert if you're making any other kind of pastry, uh, such as a cheesecake. Uh, you want to put a little crunchy topping, you can use it. You can also use this in a salad if you, if you choose. My applesauce is beginning to boil, so what I want to do is give it a stir. Okay. Turn down the heat a bit. And I'll just keep monitoring that, and eventually you'll see this color. The apples will begin to break down. When they're soft enough, I can use my spoon and it'll begin to break down for me. So we're going to continue to let that go on a low heat. So that's just one thing you can do. Otherwise, normally you'd throw the peels out, but it's actually very good nutritional value and you can do a lot with the peels. Now I have this in an airtight container. Um, I don't have to store this in a refrigerator. What I can do is I can just put this on a shelf as long as it's airtight. I've kept these the skins for up to six months. So it has a lot of applications. For the apple pie filling, 
Uh, the average filling usually is about two pounds of apples. These are about a pound and a third. These are large gala apples. Uh, basically, we're going to use three of them. That should be enough for a nine inch aluminum pie dish. So what I'm going to do again is I'm going to peel my apples and I'm going to add them to my skins. And this way I have a little bit more for a snack or I can use it for a garnish, anything else. One thing you'll learn in culinary, and nothing goes to waste, we try and use everything we possibly can. Uh, this idea of the apple skins, believe it or not, uh, it was shared about a, when I was at the, um, another, another institution where I taught, there was a student, who a uh, European student, and he told me how, how I could actually use these apple peels, and I've done it ever since. Normally, you could make this filling today, and you could finish your pie tomorrow. The longer the apples set with the spices, the cranberries, and the ginger, the better flavor you're going to get in the pie. Okay, here's our three apples. Now what I want to do is, once again, I'm going to section out the apples. I'm going to put them in this bowl. Okay, last apple, done. One of the things that I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, what I want to do is I want to show you how you can cut the apple. I want to have smaller pieces so they'll mix with my cranberries as well as the ginger that I'm going to turn around and chop up. So normally what I do is I take an eighth section of an apple and I'm just going to run my knife through it across crossways so I'm getting smaller pieces. As you can see, this will mix a lot better than that size in the pie. And it's going to make for a, a tighter filling for the pie as well. So what I'm going to do, put my apples back, slice these, and I'll take my smaller pieces, put that in my stainless steel mixing bowl. If you're doing this at home, what you want to do to handle the proper way to handle a knife would be not to stick your fingers or your thumb out. You want to curl your fingers and your thumb underneath so, and when you, as you can see my, um, the way the knife blade is, if I curl my fingers and thumb underneath, I'll never slice my fingers because the knife comes straight down. You can buy apple pie filling if you like, but if you want a really good flavor, you want to go fresh. I should also add that the knife I'm using is a six inch chef knife. It's smaller than the usual eight, nine, or 10 inch chef's knife. I like this because it's easier to handle and I can just chop faster with it. A few more to go and we're all set. These apples smell wonderful. They're very juicy. It's going to make a really, really good pie filling for us. To this, we're going to add, this is about uh, three quarters a cup of regular cranberries that you can buy in the bag. They were fresh, so we're going to add those in. To that, we are going to add a quarter teaspoon of salt. Salt brings out the flavor, believe it or not, because everything in nature wants to turn around and equal out. When you put salt into something, it's going to extract any kind of moisture that's in a product. In this case, it's going to bring out the excess moisture in the apples and the cranberries. And what does that leave? It's going to be a stronger tasting apple and cranberry. So that's basically what salt does. We're also going to put in a good tablespoon of brown sugar. Now, we're going to put in a teaspoon of cinnamon. Not that much, just enough. The last thing I'm going to do is put in, you have to use ginger. In this case, I'm using 
This is all natural ginger that's just been sweetened with sugar. What I'm going to do is chop up a few pieces and I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in our mixture. So what you want to do with the knife is just turn it sideways and you just want to rock the knife and you don't have to chop it up. You can just put small slivers, you can see. Okay. Just enough so it's going to disperse. That's what you're looking for right there. That's more than enough because what's going to happen is the heat hits the ginger itself. It's going to melt down. It'll disperse into our pie. Uh, I would say this bit here chopped should be about maybe a quarter of a cup. Now this is candied ginger. You can also use crystallized ginger if you have uh, access to a Chinese grocery store. That's where you could pick up crystallized ginger. What's the difference? It's a little harder and it's, uh, it's not as sweet as the candied ginger is. All right. Now we have our ginger, our cinnamon, brown sugar. We have our cranberries and apples. I'm going to give that a stir, but before I do that, I want to put in a little bit of flavoring agent to enhance the flavor of the apples. I came across this product, it's apple liqueur. It's about 20% alcohol, but great in flavor. So I use this in my, I'm going to use it in the apple tapioca, I'm going to use it in this pie, and I'm also going to use it in my apple blondies. I'm going to put in about a tablespoon. Take my spatula and what I want to do now is I want to toss this mixture, coat it, and I'm going to let it set for about a half hour. So this way all the flavors can meld together. And as I said before, what you can do is you can make this today and you can finish off your pie tomorrow. The apples themselves, when you put sugar to it, the term is called macerating or mac maceration. And what it's actually doing is the sugar, where salt will bring out the moisture in foods, sugar will do the same thing with fruits. Very fragrant and it's going to make for better product. You can see how the cranberries are coated and also the apple liqueur that's in it the same way. So I'm going to put that aside and leave it for about a half hour. And the next thing I'm going to do is probably put our um, pastry together. I have to refrigerate that for about 30 minutes. And then the final thing we'll do is assemble our pie and send it to the oven. Now we're going to make our uh, pie dough or pie pastry. And for that we need a stainless steel mixing bowl. But I want to get back and I want to check our apples. You can see how they're beginning to break down for us, which is really good. So we're getting close to finishing this off. You can see there's plenty of moisture in it. So when we put our tapioca in, it's going to make a nice, thick dessert for us. Now for the pie crust recipe, first off, I do have a scale that we use. Uh, it's easier if you get an electronic scale. There's two different ways you can put recipes together. You can do things by volume, such as uh, cups, measured by cups, uh, tablespoons, teaspoons. Or if you want to be more accurate, you want to go by weight. How you can do that is using a digital scale. Now, for this particular recipe, we're going to use 14 ounces of shortening. We're going to use 20 ounces of flour that I'm going to turn around. I'm going to weigh out. Uh, you can use all-purpose flour or you can use pastry flour. One thing I'll also add about the shortening, if you want to get a product that has, if you want to enhance the flavor, instead of using 14 ounces of shortening, you can use 14 ounces of butter. Or you can use a combination of the two. What will that give you? The shortening itself will give you a really flaky crust. The butter gives flavor, but not as flaky. So it's one or the other, or split the difference. Seven ounces of shortening, seven ounces of butter, and you're going to get a flaky, tasty crust. Today I'm just going to use 14 ounces of shortening. Uh, my scale is already on and what I want to do is I'm going to take my stainless steel bowl I want to Z it out. Okay, put the bowl on and you'll see it's eight looks to be about eight and a half ounces. Now I zero it out and I want 
20 ounces. I'm using pastry flour today. It's a little lighter in protein than you would normally have with all-purpose flour. It makes for a lighter product if you're doing any kind of pastries. This is what you want to use. The gluten content is also equi equated to the amount of protein that's in the flour. All-purpose is about 11, about 10 or 11 percent, whereas uh, pastry flour is about 8 or 9 percent protein, so it's actually a a lighter product. So okay, I have to get to one pound, four ounces. There we go. That's the 20 that I need. What I can do is take the flour off my scale, shut off my scale. I'm going to add in my, using a spatula, I'm going to add in the 14 ounces of the shortening. Now, this amount of shortening and uh, flour that's in here, I can get probably two small pies out of it. Um, for my purpose today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a nice oversized crust uh, for the bottom and for the top as well. I'm going to put in a quarter teaspoon of salt and I'm going to do about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight quarter teaspoons which is the equivalent of two teaspoons itself. I want to put on my gloves and I want to try and uh, mix the flour that's in with the shortening to begin with. The pastry blender, I'll show you how to use that, in the bowl is going to give me smaller particles. The bigger the particle I have, that's the more layers of fat in between, which means more tenderness when the pie actually, the crust actually cooks. If I were to work this to the point where it would be cornmeal, I'd still have a tender crust, but it would be much more mealy. So basically, the size of the granules that are left, the larger, the more flaky, the smaller, the more mealy it will be. The last thing I have to do to this crust is put in, the recipe calls for six ounces of water. Uh, believe it or not, I could probably get away with four ounces. And you'll see what it's like. So what I'm going to do, is I'm just going to mix. As you can see, I can pick it up. It's really not sticking to my hands because the flour coats my gloves. Um, if you tried to make this mixture, and I tried once, I forgot to put the water in, uh, it works fine until you go to roll it out. Then you have problems. It sticks to the counter. It sticks to the rolling pin. And that's at that point I realized what was wrong. It's like I forgot to add the water. OK, as you can see, the mixture is starting to get crumbly. This is a pastry cutter, pastry blender. Now, the idea behind it is you can just go along the side of the stainless steel bowl, and all I want to do is just go around, turn the bowl as I'm going along, and you can see what I'm actually doing is still mixing, breaking down the particles even further. Just about done. As you can see, quite a difference from what we had before what we started with. So now I can just clean off my pastry blender. I'm going to measure out six ounces of water. Now I take my spatula and I want to bring it together. Now, it's going to look like a, it's not going to, as you can see, as a pear. It doesn't really look like any kind of pie crust yet. There is some excess water, and that water is actually going to be, it's going to disperse within the dough as I continue. The proper way you want to mix, too, is you always go from the outside and fold in towards the center. And what I'm doing now, as you can see, the water is slowly dissipating. You can see the dough itself, the pie crust is wet for now, but when I let it set for 30 minutes in the refrigerator, the water will dissipate. The crust itself will become very workable. The dough right now, if I tried to pick this up, be very sticky. I'm not. So that being the case, what I'm going to do, I have to refrigerate it. Now, one of the things working with pastry doughs is the warmer it is, the harder it is to work with. 
Once I put this in the refrigerator, you'll see it's going to solidify for me. And then when I go to roll it out, when I cut it in half to make the top and I make the crust for the pie, I'm going to have to work faster. When any kind of pastry dough gets warm, the warmer it gets, the stickier it gets. You have to stop, you have to refreeze it, or you have to re-refrigerate it. And this way to get it in a cooler state. Now one of the things I will say when I roll it out is I'm on a stainless steel table, which is a lot cooler than on this cutting board or on a uh, wooden work surface. So as you can see, another indication that the moisture has been dissipated is it's shiny at first. Now you can see it has like an opaque, the, the crust itself has like an opaque color to it. So this is, it's done what I wanted to. So now what I'm going to do, get a piece of saran wrap, plastic film, put it on my board. I'm going to take the dough. Most of it came out, which is good. Not too much to scrape. Here we go. I'm going to wrap up the dough. I'm going to put it in the refrigeration for 30 minutes. And by the time I come back, you can see I can squeeze it. I shouldn't be able to do that because what's going to happen is it's going to be nice and cold. This way I can cut it in half, shape it in a disc, and then I can roll it out and we can continue making our pie. You take another look at our applesauce. Again, perfect. It's getting to the point now where it's I can take a spoon and I can cut the pieces. So I would say we probably have about another 15, 15 minutes to go. And our applesauce will be ready to make into apple tapioca. We're going to season it up with the uh, cinnamon, brown sugar, the raisins, put the um, tapioca to it. And then at that point, we're going to let it take it off the heat, chill it, and we'll be able to uh, put it in dessert dish. So I'll put this in the refrigerator. And when we come back, we're going to start our last recipe of the day, apple blondies. OK, we've, uh, we've finished our pie filling. Our uh, pastry crust is in the refrigerator chilling. Uh, we're going to take another look real quick at our apple. And you can see, look at how those apples have broke down. So in about another 15 minutes or so, we're going to finish this off. So now for our third recipe, what we're going to do is I have two remaining Gala apples. I'm going to peel those and we're going to make our apple blondies. What's the difference between a blondie and a brownie? Brownies usually have some kind of a cocoa or chocolate into it. Blondies, we're not going to have any chocolate at all. It's just going to be the flour itself. And the other ingredients we're going to put in is some cinnamon, brown sugar, white sugar. We're going to put butter in. Um, we're going to use pastry flour today instead of all purpose. And a little secret, besides the apples and the apple schnapps that we're going to put in to give it some flavor, I'm also going to use a little pinch of cayenne pepper. Now, when you're tasting certain foods in the back of your mouth is usually where you get the peppery, peppery taste. Uh, anything salty, usually on the sides of your tongue. By introducing a little bit of cayenne pepper in, it's going to make the flavor of this apple blondie linger a lot more. I learned this trick when I was reading one time uh, for Jack Daniels Lynchburg Lemonade, their secret was putting in a little cayenne pepper and it made the flavor of the lemonade linger longer. So I've tried this before and it does work. You not only have to use it for any kind of desserts, but anything at all, just a hint of anything peppery and it'll turn around and give your product more flavor. So once again, I'm gonna get my peeler. I'm also gonna get my skin bowl. We don't wanna waste the skins. I'm going to peel, and basically what I want to do is I'm going to chop the apple up. I want to get everything prepared first. Um, when I start creaming the butter and the sugar, um, I want to make sure that I have everything so this way I don't have to stop. So once again, I'll put this away. I'll take my apple sectioner. Now for this particular recipe, I want small pieces. What I don't want, I don't want to have any big chunky pieces. So I'll get my knife again, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut 
I'm going to take one eighth of a section of apple. I'm going to cut that in half. Okay. I'm going to turn the apple on its side, cut it again. And as you can see the pieces, that's going to be just what we want inside our apple blondies. Do the pieces have to be uniform? No, but you want them small enough where they're going to disperse in our baking dish. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to put that in the apples. So I can easily put it into my mixing bowl. I'm going to put it into the stainless steel bowl first. Now the next thing we want to do is we're going to make our, we're going to cream our butter with our sugar. That's known as the creaming process. For this recipe or this part, what we're going to use, uh, three quarters of a cup of brown sugar. And put that in. Just a little more to even it out. And we're going to use three quarters of a cup of regular white sugar. A little bit more. There we are. We are going to put in, uh, for this particular recipe, uh, we're going to use a stick and a quarter of butter. Now, if you happen to look at the, uh, when you buy a block of butter, you'll see where it has one pound, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. So what I'm going to do, I have a nice paring knife, a sharp one. I'm going to cut about a quarter. So that will give me the 10 ounces of butter that I need. So I'll put this on the side. Now the butter itself, if it's too hard, you won't be able to cream it. Uh, this butter has been setting out for about an hour or so. It's soft enough so it's going to cream when I put it in the mixer. So what I want to do is I put my butter and I have my sugars already in. So now I'm going to use my mixer and this is known as a flat beater or a paddle attachment. Lock in. You can also use a handheld mixer to do this. Now the idea behind this is you're creaming. When you cream, I'm just going to let that go for a bit. When you cream the butter and the sugar, you want to put it in a form that's going to mix homogeneously with the rest of your recipe. In this case, in order to get the sugar, the sugar mixes with the flour, the butter actually will help your sweetening up the butter and the dry of the sugar, a chemical reaction that occurs, everything is going to mix together rather well. Okay, I'm going to put the speed up a bit and eventually what's going to happen, okay I'll stop and I'll show you right now, basically as you can see the butter is starting to break down and it's going to get nice and fluffy. That's the texture that I'm looking for. So I'll just continue. Now, if the, if the butter and the sugar is not creamed properly, the butter is going to be too grainy. If the su uh, sugars don't go in a solution, you're not going to have a very good product. When you bite into it, you're going to taste more sugar and it's going to taste gritty. You don't want that. So you're going to make this, I'll stop it again, and you can see how it's beginning to, it's beginning to fluff up. So in about another minute or so, this should be perfect, and we're going to introduce our eggs, our flavoring, our flour, our apples. Then this part will be complete. We'll put it in a baking dish, and then we go to the oven. You can gradually increase the speed and also increases the fluffiness of the product. What you don't want is any kind of gritty texture when you're creaming. Okay, very good. Now, as you can see, it's a fluffy texture. If I were to scrape down the, uh, the flat beater, you'd have a nice mixture, a nice fluffy mixture. We're not done yet. We're going to continue. We're going to put our eggs in, our flavoring, our flour, our apples, um, also our spices, and then we're going to put it in the baking dish.
our butter and our sugars are creaming. The next step is we want to add some liquid flavoring. So once again, I'm going to add some apple schnapps to it. Uh, I'm going to put in one, about a half a tablespoon. And I'll let that mix slowly on the, if you have a uh, KitchenAid mixer, you want to put it on stir. Now, we're going to add two eggs one at a time into this mixture. Uh, this is going to give our recipe a little flavor, a little bit more flavor, texture, and eggs contain protein. So believe it or not, if you want to say the dessert is healthy, yeah, you can say, well, it's got some healthy eggs in it. So I stop my mixer, I crack, and I put in my one egg. And what I want to do is put it on stir again, and all I want to do is mix. I don't want to over mix or over whip the batter itself, uh, because if I do that, what's going to happen is it's going to be too airy a product. I want it to be light, but I don't want it to be so light that it's like a piece of cake. This is going to be like a blondie, which is the, going to be like a, not like a thick bar cookie, but somewhere in between a cake and a, uh, a thick bar cookie. All right, we're going to put our second egg in. Now this mixture at this point is going to be very light and it's going to have a lot of liquid to it. One of the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scrape down the sides. Uh, I'm going to get two cups of flour. I'm going to put in uh, two teaspoons of uh, cinnamon. Let that mix. And finally the last thing we're going to do is we're going to put in the apples that we had chopped up before. So we're just going to mix it just a tad longer and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay. The egg mixture itself, as you can see, it's kind of watery and it didn't look like the creamy. Remember how fluffy it was between the butter and the sugar? So now that we have some liquid into it, this is going to disperse into our flour and our seasonings and it's going to make for a nice thick dough or a batter that we're going to put into our mixing dish. Batters can usually be of a couple couple different times. Either it could be like a pour batter, think of pancakes, or it can be like a drop batter, chocolate chip cookies. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out two cups, two cups of flour. You can use all purpose or you can use pastry flour. I'm going to use pastry flour. There's one cup and what I want to do is once again I want to put it on stir just so I can mix it. If it's too, if the mixture itself, if I put too much dry ingredient, it's not going to get wet. I don't want to have any powder po pockets in my final product. Okay, I'll show you what it looks like. This is one cup. Once again, as you can see, uh, there's no dry ingredients, so I'm going to put my second cup in. Put it on stir. While that's mixing, I want to get my ground cinnamon. I'm going to put in one teaspoon. That's going to disperse for me. Remember I mentioned the cayenne pepper. When you're portioning out the cayenne pepper, you don't want to use a quarter teaspoon. It's too much. What you want to use is there's a couple different measurements. You can use a one finger pinch, two finger, or three finger pinch. I'm going to use a one finger pinch and I just want to sprinkle. Now as you can see, here's what our batter now looks like. Okay, it looks the same shape it was after we got through and we creamed the butter and the sugar. So now our flour is mixed in, our spices are mixed in. The last thing we have to do is we're going to put in a little cayenne pepper. This is, this is the uh, What's going to give us a little flavor? You can see that. That's about a pinch, just a tad. It does make a difference. So that's all set. Now we're going to put in our apples. Now anytime you're putting in any kind of fruit product, apples, walnuts, anything else, you never put it in the beginning. You always put it in the end and slow speed. All you want to do is just get it mixed in. You don't have to over whip or over beat your dough or your product because at that point it smashes the apples 
it serves no useful purpose. If I wanted smashed apples, I could just use a food grater and I could just, you know, put in grated apples. Okay, at this point, this is what we have. Okay, the apple chunks are in. I'm going to remove the flat beater. I'm going to take it off, put it here. All right, we're through with the mixer today. Now what I'm going to do is, here's the baking dish that I'm going to use. Okay, it's a standard Pyrex. It looks to be about maybe, oh, I don't know, 9 by 12 inches. I like to use these baking dishes. It gives you a very good, consistent product. And besides that, in the oven, I like to see the way it's cooking. As you can see, it's clear. I can see the bottom and I can see the sides as well. That's why I like to use these dishes. Uh, another thing, you can, here's a couple options you have. You can take some butter and you can uh, grease the, uh, the dish itself or you can use, uh, today I'm using an all-purpose pan coating. And all I want to do is I want to coat the sides lightly. Now that's more than enough that I need. As the heat hits the pan spray, it's going to dissipate and it'll leave like a slick surface so this way the baked good itself is not going to stick after the product comes out of the oven or after it's baking for a while. It's not going to stick at all and it's also going to make it easier when I go to slice and serve. I'm going to clean off my paddle. Okay, that's what it looks like. When you load your baking dish, you want to avoid the sides. You want to load right towards the middle. Uh, this way, when you compress down, you don't have to, you don't have to try and uh, turn around and push the material itself to the edges. Pushing in the middle, it'll automatically expand. You don't have to take your uh, spatula and try and put it on the sides. It makes for an even product and a level product. And besides that, we all eat and drink with our eyes. It looks better appealing when you don't see a dish where you have dough marks or anything burned on the side. Right down the middle. I'm going to put in my dough. Now, here, what I want, all I have to do is push down in the middle, and you can see how my batter is going towards the edges. The last thing I want to do is I want to get a tasting spoon, and I want to scrape off my excess batter. Every little bit is important. So now we have our apple blondies. This is what the product looks like. We're going to put it in an oven that's been preheating at 325 degrees. We're going to give this 50 minutes and it's going to be perfect. When it comes out, it should be double in the size if you look at it. Right now it's about maybe a half inch. It's going to come up about an inch. The apples will cook. Nice aroma and you're going to have wonderful apple blondies. So now in the oven, I'll set my timer for 50 minutes, and next time we see those, they're going to be beautiful apple blondies. Okay, we're going to whirl out our pie dough and finish off our apple cranberry ginger pie, but before we do that, we're going to finish off our apple tapioca. So as you can see, right now, it looks like applesauce. This turned out really good. Look at how moist it is, and you can see how our apples, remember how they were? Big, thick chunks. Now they broke down for us. So... To this mixture, I'm going to season it with a nice heaping tablespoon of cinnamon. We're going to okay. now it's going to darken this up a bit. Now we're going to put in a little, we're going to put in two tablespoons of light brown sugar. Now, before I put the tapioca in, that's going to actually thicken this mixture, what I want to do first is I want to mix it up. I want to mix in the sugar and I want to mix in the cinnamon. Once you thicken up, it's kind of tough to adjust the seasoning. So what I want to do now, before I put the thickening agent in, I'm going to take a I always have some tasting spoons and what we're going to do is I want to taste and I want to make sure the flavor profile is the way I want it. So, now most folks would take like a little bit, you take a spoonful. If you're going to taste something, you really want to get a good taste. If 
right on the money. I'm not going to put anything else into it. So now, what I'm going to do is I measure it out. This is three tablespoons of minute tapioca. This is our thickening agent. I am going to turn up the heat a bit. I'm going to start stirring in the tapioca. Now, the tapioca is a starch, and basically a starch itself can absorb five times its weight. So in this case, the free moisture or the free liquid that's in our apple sauce is going to be tightened up and turn it into tapioca. You can use this as a very, a very good gelled dessert. If you wanted to put this, let's say, oh, in a dish, which I'm going to do later, you can refrigerate it and it's almost going to be like a nice pudding type texture. All right. It's going to take a little while. As you can see, it's starting to get thick, but I'm just going to keep it. I want to let this cook. The tapioca itself has to cook in. So I'm going to just let that set. Our flavor is there. Now it's just a matter of letting this cook. Now, if you find out it's too thick, don't worry. All you have to do is put in some water. Just put a little liquid. Any kind of liquid, you can actually thin it out. with. You can use cider, you can use apple juice, or in my case, uh, I'll probably use just water if it's too thick. But coming along good. Adjust my flame. Now we're all set. Okay. All right. Now we're going to work on our pie crust. Finish off our pie and send it to the oven. Remember how the, uh, the dough was at one point? As you can see, it solidified. And as I take off the plastic wrap, you can see it's hardly sticking at all. Now what I want to do before I begin to roll this out, the first thing I want to do is I want to get some flour and I want to put it on my table. This way, if I were to put down the pastry dough on this surface, it would stick. I don't want that to happen. This is a, a bench cutter or a bench scraper. And basically what you do is I can move my flour around. I can get under the pie crust later on. I'll show you how that works. And I can also cut my dough. Now what I want to do is cut the dough in half. Okay. And I want to put the dough, I want to wrap it, just introduce it to some flour. Now, if I were to put my hand on, you can see how the dough stuck to my hand. If I were to do it on this side, the only thing that's sticking is flour. It comes off. It's easier for me to handle the dough this way. So the first thing I want to do, once I put it in the flour, is I want to create a disc. It makes it easier to roll out to get a bottom crust and to get a top crust. Now once again, this dough that I prepared is enough for two pies. All I want to do when I roll out the dough, I have a just about a round shape. So what I want to do is go forward and to the side. All I want to do is I'm going to expand my circle. Okay? And I don't have to put a lot of, everybody figures you put a lot of pressure there. You don't have to. As you can see how my dough is rolling out. Now, I want to make sure, see, plenty of flour it shouldn't stick. All right. Now, how do I know, A, when my uh, pie crust is big enough? Now, what I want to do is I can get underneath, okay, with my bench scraper, and I can turn my dough once again with my rolling pin. Hardly any effort, as you can see, because the weight of the rolling pin is doing the work for me. You take your, in this case, I'm using an aluminum pie tin. I know there's enough on the edges that if I were to lift this up and put this crust in the bottom, I know it's going to cover and it's going to give me some overhang on the edges, which is just what I want. As I'm going to take my bench knife, and as you can see, because I used enough flour, it's not going to stick on me. I should be able to lift that right up. Now in some cases, I can get underneath, let's see, should be able to lift this right up, put it right in my shell. Look at that. You want to lift up the edge, and as if you're doing wall-to-wall -wall carpet, the best way I can describe it, you want to just make sure you shimmy down, and you want to get in the bottom of the dish along the edge. You want to just tuck it in so it fits tight. Don't worry about this little piece here. You can always mold it. Now, if you were making a, uh, if the filling was already done and you weren't going to cook it in the oven, what you do is you dock or you'd take a fork, you'd put holes and you'd blind bake this crust. 
then you'd put your finished fruit filling in it. Because we're making a pie in the oven today, we don't have to worry about docking it. All our ingredients are going to go in. We're going to egg wash. I'm going to show you how to egg wash the side. Okay. There's a few ways you can uh, cut your crust. You can use a knife and go right around and holding it, you can just scrape the side of your uh, pie tin or you can use kitchen scissors. It doesn't make a difference, whatever you feel comfortable with. In this case here, what I want to do, all I have to do is keep with the integrity of the outside of the crust. And I'm going to get a very nice, let me put a camera angle, I'll show you. All I have to do is just cut. My knife always scrapes the side of the pie tin. Okay. One crust down. The other one's going to go on top. Now what I'm going to do now, take my excess dough. Yes, you can re-roll this if you like. Okay, but I'm going to put it on the side for now. I'm going to go back to where we had our apples. And you can see how it turned out between the spices and everything else. That's got some great flavor. So now I'm going to fill my, fill my pie. Now one thing about the pieces, because they're so small, I can use a lot of filling in this. I want a nice tight filling in my pie. I don't want to have a lot of air pockets. So, and the apples themselves, they are going to shrink. So in this case here, the filling I made was enough for a pie and a half, but I'm still going to put in as much as I can. Now you've got to remember, this is going to sink down. The apples, they're going to shrink. Um, one of the other ingredients that I use sometimes, depending upon the apples, if they know the apple is going to give out a lot of moisture, I don't want a soupy pie, so what I'll do is I'll put in a little flour, or you can use cornstarch, and what that does, that lets your... Uh, that lets, the starch itself will um, contain or it will eliminate the excess moisture. So now we have this wonderful nice pie. Let me put my filling away. Now we're going to put the top on the pie. We're going to roll out this crust again. But before we do that, a little trick, take your bench scraper. If there's any dough or anything stuck to the top, the surface is pretty good. We'll put it on the side here. Once again, we're going to give it a little sprinkle, pastry flour. Our applesauce is doing rather well, our apple tapioca. And once again, we want to roll our crust and we want to make a disc. I go back and get my rolling pin. Okay, and once again, I just want to push down a little bit, let, the, let it do the work. All right, I turn it over because I want to get both sides enough flour on it. And if I see that it's a little wet, all right, just put a little flour on it. Okay, all right, okay, not bad. I take my pastry knife. Underneath, I want to make sure I can be able to pick this up. I'll be able to once again put it on my pie. But before I do that, we're going to make an egg wash. And in order to do that, we're going to use one whole egg. I'm going to put it in this little dish and I'm going to pour some cream into it. And I want to make a coating. Now, the egg wash I'm going to use, I want to wash the edge of my pie so this way when I put the top on it, it's going to stick. It's not going to come apart when it breaks. So what you do is you just take one egg, I'm going to put a little cream into it. That's all we need. Now I'm going to take a regular fork, break the yolk, mix it up. All I want to do is I just want to dip the end of the brush and I want to go all around my I want to go around my pie. And all I want to do, all I'm doing to this, believe it or not, is I'm creating a little glue. 
natural glue, if you will call it, and my crust is going to stick to the pie. I don't have to worry about uh, it coming apart when it gets the heat. So now what I want to do is get my dough. Let's see. I want to come up, put it on my pie, and once again, here we go. Now, I'm going to seal the edges, but before I do that, once again, what I want to do is take my knife and go around the edge of the pie, and I'm just going to cut the crust. And I should have a nice, even crust all the way around. All I have to do is make sure I follow the circumference of the pie tin. Doesn't make a difference what size I'm using. It could be 9 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch pies. You just have to follow. Now I'm sealed. Now I could turn around and take a fork, but Grandma used to just turn around and just take her thumb, pinch it down. The items inside the pie, they're going to cook. They're going to create steam. Now if I don't allow for that steam to come out, the pie could explode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my paring knife once again and I'm going to cut slits. This is going to allow for any steam to come out of my pie and the pie will not explode. There's nothing worse than putting the time and effort into making a nice baked product and all of a sudden you pull it out of the oven and it's it's broken, a broken crust. You don't want that. So here we have our our knife. I've cut some slits into it. So the final thing I'm going to do before we go into the oven, okay, once again, get my egg wash. Here we go. Go right all over the pie. Now you'll notice, once again, okay, the pie itself is opaque. It's flat in color. But look what happens when I put the egg wash on it. The final result of the pie is going to have a nice sheen to it. All right. Be as liberal as you want with the egg wash. I've known some master pastry chefs. They say, you egg wash, they would put this pie in the refrigerator for 15, 20 minutes until it sets. They'd pull it back out of the refrigerator, egg wash a second time. They'd get a beautiful, beautiful golden finish. But for normal purposes, especially today, that's good enough. Our pie has been washed. We've got our slits into it. Um, I'm going to put it in the oven. And we're going to give it 50 minutes, and we're going to take a look at it. So here we go. Let me open the oven. I'm going to put it on the bottom deck. Set my timer, and we'll check it in 50 minutes. As you can see, I pulled out the, uh, our apple blondies. You can see the difference in how nice and beautiful they are. They turned out. They're thick. We're going to cut those. Here's our pie. It's been cooling. You can see the nice color. Uh, a little bit of golden color to it. We're going to slice that. And one other thing, I was finishing off our apple tapioca. I load my dish. It's still kind of hot, which is good. And I'm going to show you one other thing we're going to do with this. Okay. Serve it with a spoon. Just as a little, that's going to be soft. So we could take some, as you can see. We can just put a little crunch on the top. And this adds an extra flavor, number one and number two. It's also going to give uh, a little crunch and texture to our dessert. So there's our apple tapioca. Now, let's slice our apple blondies. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to push down and I can cut. I'm going to cut my apple blondies. And finally our pie. And there you have it. There's three apple desserts. You have been watching The Chef's Cook on CCP-TV, the educational channel for the Community College of Philadelphia. I'm Chef Bill. See you soon.